Hello and welcome to The Pouch, the unmatched socks of podcasts which aims to help the average Aussie try and make sense of their current political environment. I'm Greg. I have too many hue lights in my room, Savage. <laughs> and I'm Jake. I didn't prepare anything for this intro for <laughs> Wharton. <laughs> On today's episode, we have a very special guest with us. We have uh, Pete Smithson from the Aussie English Podcast. Uh, Pete, we go way back uh, when, before before podcasts were even invented. Man, those were the days. That was back when our podcast was about the size of Joe Rogan's, right? It was. It was literally the size of Joe Rogan's podcast, and we did it in, in garages, literally in garage, using garage band. We put it to good use. How are you coping during these um, during these times before we get before we get to the nitty gritty of it? How are you coping at the moment? Are you, are, have you been stuck inside? Wow, I've been working on my studio tan, so. <laughs> <laughs> nah, uh, yeah, it's nothing. It's changed. working. It's I'm working. A, I'm a full time podcaster. It's my life now. So I pretty much didn't even know we had coronavirus until last week. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, well, well, that's. I think every second podcast is about um, is about coronavirus at the moment. So you've sort of missed the train there. We'll we'll get to all of that. We'll get to your history of how you became a podcaster and a full time podcaster, mind you, um, which is amazing. So check out Aussie English um, if you're bored during. This this interview <laughs> and you need to work well, on your English <laughs> well, yeah so um so uh Pete uh, I want to start by just talking about um yeah basically really how you got started in this so so we, you know the the way that we uh knew each other was we got into podcasts before all of this sort of stuff then you sort of dip down a little bit out of our lives and then all of a sudden you pop back up and you've got this podcast Aussie English podcast tell us about it and and how it sort of got started well you guys were the reason really I think I was and that's the end of the interview. Yeah. Thanks so much, Pete. <laughs> it was great um, talking to you, buddy. Yeah, well. You're welcome. Well, this would have been back in 2010, right, where we were going to the Atheist Conference when that movement was sort of taking hold in Australia. Richard Dawkins, Hitchens, the Four Horsemen and everything were a big thing um, worldwide. And we were getting into, you know, secular critical thinking and all of the science that was going around. And I know Jake had his podcast. I, I can't remember the year that it started, but I remember on Facebook, I think you asked... I need to get someone to come on to do a science clip. And I was doing my master's of science at the time and, and sent in, I think I sent in something talking about phases of the moon or something. I can't remember what the um, mm. exact topic was. but Sounds about right, yeah. Jake obviously had no one else apply and was like, <laughs> <laughs> you'll do. It's actually not true. I, I did have several people apply. Um, it's just none of them were as charismatic as, as you clearly were. Yes. You know, so thanks, thanks to that decision. It's one of those things, isn't it? It's funny that you have those moments. You look back at your life, and you're like, there are these key moments that happen where you're like, okay, that the branch bifurcated, and I mm. went one direction over another. So I ended up on Jake's podcast, obviously, Imaginary Friend Show. Met met um, the handsome Greg over here as well. I think on the first show that I would have been on, um, and then yeah, I guess did that for a few years, right, Jake? Sporadically, you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then you were the, you were the resident person who knew what they were talking about. Oh, I don't <laughs> and know then about I found that. someone else. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think I started a PhD and got too busy, so um, yeah, dropped off the radar. And then I guess the the real reason that I got back into it was that I started finding it interesting uh, to learn languages. I was really interested in learning a foreign language. I felt kind of ashamed being an Australian living in Melbourne. I'd started training at a um, a jiu jitsu MMA gym. And most of the people there were foreigners. They were students from China, from Singapore, from France, Germany, and they all spoke English, but they all spoke multiple other languages. And so I started to feel a bit, you know, like, Oof, why don't I speak another language? I went down the sort of rabbit hole of learning French online. I'd done that at school. Uh, so I had a bit of a background, just had to sort of rekindle that. And um, after about six months, got fluent in French after, you know, practicing a lot, going to meetups, practicing every day, reading books, listening to podcasts. And I was listening to a podcast called Francais Authentique and he did what I effectively ah, yes. do. Yes, it's a classic. Yeah, it's a classic it. Authentic podcast. French, Francais Authentique. So <laughs> okay. he's huge. But um, I took his idea big and made it. Big fat guy, very big, <laughs> girthful <laughs> gentleman. Yeah. Presume you mean very successful. Very, 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 very successful. But um, I remember saying to a bunch of the people at the gym, you know, who were saying to me, bloody hell, Australian English is so hard to understand. The accents, the slangs, the expressions you guys use, the, you know, cultural references all the time. You guys are just like really hard to understand. And I said, well, go find a podcast. There must be a podcast for, yeah. you know, Australian English or something out there. Lo and behold, there was nothing. 
So I said, well, wow. you know, I did podcasting for quite a while and had a background in using Audacity and some of these other things, had a microphone from my Muso days and then just yeah. took, it, took it upon myself to start creating episodes to help people. Mm, nature and, um, does explore it does uh, abhor a an unexplo- unexploited that was it was a very uh, <laughs> excellent um thing that I was trying to say there a vacuum. nature nature abhors an unexploited niche doesn't it yes chortle exactly. chortle exactly what, so it. what is what is uh, Aussie English can you can you sort of describe take us through what do you do on the show how well, do you approach it etc originally it was you know oh, I'll teach everyone Australian expressions and Australian slang and yep. then I, I mm. looked that up and was like, well, there's a lot of it, but also there's, that's, <laughs> that's not much, you know, in terms, that's a very narrow niche and Australian English, you know, is very broad. It's much broader than just our, you know, whatever, as dry as a nun's nasty and, you know, servo and all that sort of stuff that, you know, we use, we, but we, we don't. We take for granted. Yeah. yeah. Like. Yeah. So I just decided I'll, I, I initially started with that sort of stuff, you know, using mm. the, the character, the um, stereotypes. And then pretty pretty quickly was like, you know what, I should just teach English and make English content with an Australian lens. And so then it became about just Australian English. And then after that, I was like, you know what, I really want to share more of Australian culture and history and news and current affairs and and really help people who are coming here to make it, to integrate, to set their lives up in Australia. I want to give them not just content to learn English, but content that's going to help them learn English whilst also improving their knowledge of, you know, the Australian government, our history, our culture, everything like yeah. that. So it's it's turned into pretty much I just talk about Australia, you know, different topics, and sometimes I'll talk about expressions, but it's really just creating content about Australia and then making it English learning content for people to use if they desire. And you you have your you have your, your father is a regular figure on your podcast. Tell us how that came about. Oh man, I think he's he's very similar to Jake. He's a a know it all, right? So <laughs> and he has an opinion an opinion on everything. So I said to Dad, you know, I need to talk about the news, and you're someone in my family who's obviously Australian and and has an opinion on everything. Um, did you want to come on so that? Mm. people can hear another Australian speaking. They can hear a natural discussion where it's spontaneous. We interrupt one another. You know, we just like, like this conversation. It's, it's, you know, not planned. We're not reading off a script and we can talk about the news. Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> hey. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty much it became that. I, we are very weird. This is word for word exactly what I've got written down. Thank you very much. No, that's it. But um, yeah, it just started out with getting him to come on. And it, 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 funnily enough, because he has an opinion on everything, it pretty much becomes me introducing a news story and then asking him what he thinks. So it's pretty much, it's, yeah, right. it's pretty much me interviewing my dad every week. <laughs> That's fantastic. And so yeah. it it is. It's very very lovely. I think it's really good that you have that sort of connection. And and I suppose you know that's the thing with podcasters or YouTubers, isn't it? it, it, it you sort of eventually it becomes part of part of your life, right? It yeah. becomes like people start to start to want to get to know you and and who you are, and and so all of a sudden your connection to your family becomes interesting. You've also got a, a, a son who's part of your podcast yeah, well, as well. And that's yeah. there's it's a fine line there. So when I f- he was naughty yesterday, I saw I saw you holding. I know. Well, <laughs> yeah, I had it. The thumbnail was you with him, and it's, and it's got the word naughty, and I was like, yeah, naughty's not too Australian, is it? I don't nah, know. But well, it's English, right? <laughs> now nah, someone was asking me, and one of my students, they were they were asking, you know, can you? Use naughty in a cute kind of way, or is it really nasty to say that? Is it really horrible? And I was like, oh, yeah, you could probably use it. You know, he's a naughty boy. It could be a joke, or you mm, know, he's mm. he's a horrible naughty boy. Or you could use it, you know, in the bedroom. He is a naughty boy. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of different <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of different uses. But yeah, doing the podcast was very awkward at, at, in the beginning in terms of I you have no idea about what people are like in front of a camera. And so I would be recording things on my phone to share. I would include certain family members who I would later find out are very uncomfortable with being on camera. And so <laughs> it was a very interesting thing to have to kind of You're talking and, about privacy issues? Not privacy, <laughs> they just don't they don't feel comfortable and so even if they're in the background, um I I remember I did a a um I did a little Instagram, you know, news feed thing. One of those things that goes on and then disappears a day later with my niece. And that became a huge thing where my um, my sister was not happy about that. So And now you're no longer in the will. 
Well, mm. yeah. Well, she's the younger sister, so it doesn't matter anyway. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't know. You forget, right? Because you're yeah. fine with it all the time. The same with using Noah. I I use him. I use him. I have him in videos. I try and include him <laughs> because I want to. I want. I want it to be a part of his life, you know. But I. I try not to think of it. People will look at it and see, you know, ah. Oh, you could be just exploiting your son or whatever. And so there's those, you kind of have to try and balance those two things. But I think if you're doing it from a good place, then you don't really have to overthink it too much. But yeah, it is sure, interesting. Sure, but he, he, he's also, uh, you know, part of a bilingual family as well though, isn't he? So I, exactly. I'm s- certainly he's going to be benefiting from the things that you engage and involve him in, right? That's it. Well, that's it. He's he's a freak on the phone already, and he's only eleven months old. He already knows <laughs> how to swipe. <laughs> yeah, get get to the camera, start Naughty. taking photos. But um, it it is interesting, and I think you don't appreciate until you start doing something like podcasting how much what you're saying, the content you're creating, is being used or is being heard, listened to, consumed by other people out there that you don't necessarily have an appreciation for. And so I've had probably hundreds of people. S- tell me now i've listened to every single episode and wow. i'm just like there's 720 episodes on the podcast <laughs> the average yes, I've length listened to every single one yeah. <laughs> yes yeah. and you forget you you forget or you don't know how much people after listening to a, a fairly substantial amount of you talking they begin to understand you or like see you as a friend or you know it is a very interesting yeah, relationship. familiar type of relationship yeah, it yeah. was just funny. Like one example, we moved to Canberra because my wife started working for the um, the Brazilian embassy there and we were walking around the streets doing some photography, my wife and I, and all of a sudden this guy was pointing at us and I was like, oh, no, I've, you know, freaked some guy out taking a photo and he was in it and he's going to be like, you know, what the F was this? So I delete that photo. And he walks over and he's like, man, I just got here from Brazil yesterday and the first person I see in Canberra is you and I've been listening well, to your podcast for six uh, months. Well, and I was that like, is so cool. I was like, what the that hell? is the most <laughs> lovely thing in the world. Yeah, but it, I, I, it's creepy too at the same time. Sure, it's amazing. Sure. Yeah. But it was, um, yeah, it is there very were always, bizarre. Um, Pete, there were always, and Greg, I, I think we all probably experienced it, you know, back in sort of the, you know, whatever, early days of podcasting back when we were doing Imaginary Friends and we were doing, you know, the live shows down in Melbourne and uh, as part of the book launch and and all of those sorts of things. And people were a little bit overly familiar. You know, they did, you know, some of them did feel that they that they knew you perhaps better than, um, than other people and thus had uh, the right to invade your space and... Uh, <laughs> You know? it's, well, it's so hard. I, I listen to Joe Rogan every, you know, second or third day because he has such interesting people on there that he's interviewing. And I probably listened by this time to hundreds of hours of Joe Rogan talking, his opinions, yeah. his yeah. views, you know, sharing his, his past, his thoughts, his history. And so I would imagine if I met him, he would never have, you know, heard anything of me unless he was working on his Aussie accent. And yet I would be like, here's someone I've probably spoken to more than I've spoken to, you know, my friends in the last few years. Yeah, like, it's it's in, her, that's her really from. interesting, isn't it? And you know, the beautiful thing about podcasts is that they're free too. Uh, you know, and 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 like, there's no real sort of unless people sort of voluntarily pay. There's not a real sort of you could if you've got a phone, you've got a podcast player, yeah. and if you've got a podcast player, you've got access to so so much stuff. And um, you know, it, it, it's it's it it the quality seems to be pretty interesting too, but I, I, I want to come back to, I want to come back to um, the, the, I suppose the idea that you, you know, you started to get noticed and you started to get some appreciation for what you were doing, which means that you were probably having a very positive impact on a lot of this, uh, on a lot of these people. What, what is that positive impact? Um, you know, and I suppose what were people missing out on before you came, you came along, like, and how were they getting that information? I think it's a good question. I think, sort of finishing the last question I know <laughs> finishing the last question I do kind of see my responsibility now to show people my life because I kind of feel the responsibility to show people what it is like to live in Australia my to sh- give people my thoughts and opinions on things whether or not they agree with me isn't the point but just so they have an idea so that they can better learn about Australia because I appreciated that from Francais Authentique, that podcast, the French podcast I was listening to, he would always tell his opinions on things, what was happening with his family, what he was struggling with, what was happening in France. And, and that was why he was so successful because people got sucked into that. They, they felt like they were listening to a friend, someone who was open and honest. And you do, 
there's, there's, I think that's why people resonate with Joe Rogan so much is because he mm. does just open up about his life, his opinions and everything as opposed to just have a list of questions with his interviewers and not share any of him personally and just ask the questions. Yeah. And- well, it's called the Joe Rogan experience, exactly. isn't it? Like it's, you know, let, let's let's sit down and have, a, and have a human experience together. Yeah. I think people resonate with that and they find that very authentic. And so I think that was something that was potentially missing in terms of English learning content at the time to, to your latter question there, where a lot of the time there were podcast, there's loads of podcasts for learning English, but they tend to be off a script. There's no personality there. It's just a voice, you know, reading off the script, teaching. The boy went to the park. Yeah, exactly. And so people, <laughs> That's very they, good, they can Thank use you. it. I they did can, this professionally. They can use that sort of content <laughs> to learn, but they can't yep. necessarily resonate with it and, dive further into understanding you know the the context would you say yeah well just what it's like to be an australian as well right so how i view the world so yes and And what you're allowed to say right because like some people where it's hard sometimes where they're not allowed to say certain things and they get in trouble for that exactly and so i want to show people you know what it's i want to give people a behind the scenes look at what an australian you know, thinks like, behaves like, at least in mm. my context of where I grew up in Australia. Obviously, I don't represent mm. everyone, but um, yeah, that's the. So, basis. You, are you, you the reason yeah. why there's so many Brazilians visiting now? A hundred percent. I, I see. I have a very big <laughs> problem with Brazilians. They, they, I mean, I, think, Bolson, just, I think Bolsonaro is the reason that a lot of the Brazilians <laughs> are visiting. It. That could be it. Just, just, I just want to complete my thing so that people don't <laughs> don't think that I'm racist mm. against Brazilians. Not that that's necessarily a thing, but uh, they're just so good looking. Mm-hmm. It's like as as a people, they're they're. I mean, I I'm. I'm shredded, right? <laughs> and and they're all shredded naturally. And they're all beautiful people. It's just and their language. I mean, Portuguese is such a I mean, it's I, I can't, there's no way I will ever speak Portuguese. It's too too complex of a language for me anyway. I, I know you're looking at me like, "Jake, we had this discussion last week." And it's like one of the easiest things. But I've, you know, my my, my brother who married a Brazilian, they 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 just they, I can't understand it. There's no way I'll ever speak it. And I speak Italian. It's just so much of a different language. But, yeah. Well, I think you have just, to have the motivations difficult. in place too. If you're not married to a Brazilian, you know, you're not interested That's what in it soccer. Is. You're not That's interested in going is. there. It's soccer. a little harder. <laughs> I love the soccer. But, yeah. No, it is. So, so you, are, you, you are responsible for the influx of Brazilians is what you're no, saying. No, I think I just capitalised on it by um, <laughs> meeting a Brazilian, marrying a Brazilian, having a half Brazilian baby, speaking Portuguese at home and often showing that on Instagram. So I think half my followers probably are Brazilian. Yeah. <laughs> But so you, you when when you were when you were you spoke earlier about when you went to the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and you said that you felt shame like as an Australian was that purely because of the of the language that that we only know sort of one language or like it's tokenistic in primary schools or was there other sort of um, was there more to it than that? I think it's mostly that in terms of you just see these people who are so experienced culturally they've they've come from foreign countries they're you know in high paying jobs they're well educated they speak multiple languages they work their asses off in order to get to where they Mm. are and and i felt you know obviously i'm not in the same position as them because i'm living in my home country where it's not really very useful for me to necessarily speak a foreign language if i'm you know friends with 90 percent australian people but when i was suddenly surrounded by all these people from other countries who spoke multiple languages and you would interact with them on a daily basis you know in melbourne these days you get on a tram and and you're more likely to hear chinese or mandarin chinese indonesian portuguese than you are english because there's just so many um young students that have come over i think you know the average age in melbourne's probably 21 or something crazy and Yeah, yeah i felt that 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 sort of shame and embarrassment of i'd never put in the hard yards to get to where they've gotten you know and mm. so, and and it seems like it's something that has, it seems to characterize most of Australia, the US, New Zealand, Britain, you know, any of these countries that are native English speakers. The pro, it's it's a two edge blade, right? The biggest problem is that the most useful language in the world is English. So if you already speak it, yeah, right. there's no real reason to learn another language in terms of uh, it'll yeah. get me a better job, it'll lead to better prospects unless you've gone down a very specific route 
in terms of, you know, I don't know, trade with Brazil or politics in China or something like that, where obviously it'll give you an edge. Even then, though, the people you're going to interact with probably speak English way better than you're going to ever speak their language because they've yep. been learning yeah. it since they were five, you know, so... And we're motivated to do that so that, you know, in many ways it's to get out of certain classes uh, in order to elevate themselves. It's yeah, Exactly. It, it makes a lot of sense. Exactly. And that's one of the things too. I found that it's so hard learning a foreign language as an English native speaker because it it is so much more on you to kind of discipline and motivate yourself. Yeah. Because, What's your motivation? Uh, for me, it's my wife, right? Yeah, so yeah. without yeah. her, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, there's probably zero chance that I would speak Portuguese as well as I do today because I would have no need to. I would have to go out of my way to find Brazilians. So it's a, a lot more work. Whereas if yeah. I was a Brazilian living in Brazil, English is a way out of poverty or a way of elevating myself, of getting a better career, of learning more about the world. You know, if I'm a Brazilian Portuguese speaker and I want to learn about Japanese history, chances are I can't find that in Portuguese. And this is one of those things I face all the time, looking for content in Portuguese. It's like you're going down a funnel into a much smaller pool of content if you're leaving the English speaking world and going into any other language because there's yeah, right. almost certainly less content than there is in English. And yeah. that also is is very difficult. So Especially with like I suppose the internet and, and that sort of thing too, like trying to find those um, those resources. I mean everything that's sort of uh, even older documents and all that yeah. sort of stuff are uploaded and from from those uh, English. Go to Wikipedia. As well. Go to Wikipedia yeah. and change any any of the pages into foreign languages. So if you went to his, yeah. history of Australia, change it into any of the languages down the side, the article's gonna halve or probably, you know, become a third of the length that it was in English. So it's, it's it's interesting that um that I suppose you come at it you know you you sort of started this from an angle of of that I wouldn't say embarrassment I, I like your word shame I suppose but obviously there's something about Australia that it, that is attractive to these people who who are coming I mean they're listening to your podcast before they get here they're listening to your podcast when they're here um you know you're 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 pre- prepping them for for coming over here what is it about I mean, it's probably maybe it's obvious. I don't know, but what is it about Australia that you see generally, or, or specifically to other countries, um, that that's attracting them to 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 be here, to come here? It depends on the country. I think if we were to start with Brazil, Australia's pr- yeah. Let's let's do alphabetically. <laughs> Azerbaijan, well, please. That's it. Well, those guys. I've got a few students. You know, hey, Akan, he's from Azerbaijan. So. Um, wow. Hey, Akan. He, I would say though, Brazil, for instance, they want to come here because of the climate. It's an English-speaking country. They've got, I think their first choice tends to be America. Then they've got, you know, places like Canada and Britain and New Zealand. But ideally, Mm. I think Brazilians hate the cold weather. And so even the ones in Melbourne whinge constantly in in winter. You know, I would have my second Dan Black Belt, one of the toughest guys I know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructors, have the biggest theory when it was, you know, 10 degrees outside. (laughs) <laughs> and and um, so I think that's part of what's drawing Australia. He did know there's other places to live, yeah? Yeah, well... He- like, <laughs> like it's quite a vast <laughs> continent. That's it, that's it, yeah. <laughs> but um, that was a big thing, I think. Climate and then culture. I think they, they do have an understanding that the Australian culture is very different from, say, American because you are kind of... America is the land of opportunity and there's a lot of freedom there, but there's also a lot of guns. There's a lot of... Um, crime comparatively to somewhere like Australia and you don't have the same kind of social security that you would have if you come to Australia once you become a permanent resident with getting things like Medicare, um, you know, having the minimum wage here, everything like that. So there's that. There's other countries you'll have, especially in Southeast Asia, where it's more about proximity and I think um, price. So it's a lot cheaper for someone from China to come to Australia and get educated at an incredibly good university, Mm. like, you know, Mm. Monash University, Melbourne University, whatever, and it's right next door so they can pay to have that done a lot easier than, say, try and go to America or Canada or or Britain. So there's that aspect as well. And I think, too, with places like China, there's probably the trade. You know, if you get your degree in business in Australia or you learn Australian English, you're probably most likely to, if you're working in trade and, and business, have a relationship with Australia than, say, America or, or Great Britain because, you know, we're next door. So mm. there tends to be a lot of those sorts of, of reasons. Other ones will be political, places like Iran. I have a load of Iranians 
always messaging me, telling me about coming out to Australia. Is that the appropriate collective noun? Yeah, I was going to say. Iranians, a load of Iranians. A a flock. (laughs) Flock flock of them. I don't know what you would use it. Uh, But yeah, they are trying to get away from, I think, their regime, if I am not putting myself in too much trouble by mentioning that. And I think China tends to be similar. There'll be a smaller percentage of the Chinese students I'll meet will be like, I just wanted to live in a freer country. And mm. the other ones will be, I just wanted an Australian education and then I'm going home and I don't care about right. governments or politics. I like China. I just want the education. I'm out. That's that's probably very politically savvy maybe of those uh, Chinese uh, students because, the, you know, there is, of course, uh, they are heavily watched while they are here, um, particularly on campus at, um, you know, at various universities. I wonder whether I can ask you a bit of a political question and specifically about your, your, your wife, um, is she, is she got citizenship? She's about to get permanent residency, assuming okay. the interview goes well when they finally um, ring us up. Okay, well, I won't jeopardise that. Then I did have a question about because uh, quite 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 often at citizenship ceremonies, it's conducted by a former uh, politician. Yeah. Um, in the case of um, in the case of my brother's wife, it was. Um, uh, former international affairs uh, minister Philip Ruddock, um, who was a really interesting dude in in uh, in in northwestern Sydney. But uh, no, all right, I'll save that for when she does. I'll save that question for when she does get citizenship. But good good luck. Hope the interview goes the, well. I know. Eventually. Part two. Even I'm hanging on. Look at that. But that's. I'm excited. We could talk about that as well. I guess we've had to drop seven and a half grand to apply. Yeah. And. And it's a, you know, we had to pay a lawyer about three grand to do the application so that we didn't screw anything up. And then they just say, we'll call you in the next two years at some point to do a checkup. And then you'll, you, if you pass, you'll get it. You know, I mean, this is this is how the government keeps everyone employed, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Firstly, the first role of, of public service is to justify the public service, so you got to you got to pay for it, yeah. um, and then you know you got to you got to keep our most important citizens um, in work as well, of course, uh, being lawyers. Um, so uh, it's it's really important to ensure that they get a slice of the pie. Um, who else? You, you've got the immigration officials. There's normally a whole bunch of uh, applications and and uh, you know regular uh, upkeep on those sorts of things. You got to keep. Uh, you got to translate documents. So you got to pay for translators. Man, that's crazy. Yeah, that it's, was expensive. Uh, <laughs> it's a whole process. It's a whole thing. It is. There are yeah, whole industries is. around this. Oh, absolutely. My law- the lawyer that we paid, she only does applications for visas. So. That's crazy. Mm. That's crazy. So, what? Uh, how long has the, the the process been? How long has it been? I think it's been six months since we've submitted it. But we were. Yeah, right. You have to gather evidence for a good year. You have to have been together for a year. You have to gather evidence. So every time we went anywhere with family, we had to try and get photos with other family members to show that Kel had integrated into Australia and into my family. So you couldn't just have, you know, people saying, "Yeah, they're a good couple." You would have to show over months and months and months that she went to this party with these people. She went to this party with Mm. these people. We had to get written, you know, people write essays saying that we're a good couple and it's long-term who weren't related to us. You know, there's, there's loads of stuff. And I understand why it's there because there are, you know, loads of old men going to Thailand and, you know, trying to bring someone back and get paid 50 grand to marry them, give them citizenship and then go back. And that's the the best best Wait, case scenario. On. What is that? What is that plan? <laughs> Can you just run that by me again? <laughs> write it in my. Well, what, what, I imagine uh, that's why they they set it up that way to be strict and to avoid, I think, the issue of um, abuse, right, between couples, because you could hypothetically be a horrible human being, generally a male who holds citizenship over your partner and threatens them and uses it against them in order to get right. them to do certain things. And so they, I think they had issues with that and that was why as well they tightened up the restrictions. And, that, and that's, a, that's part of bureaucracy, isn't it? I mean, we live in, a, in, a, in a quite a full-on bureaucracy here in Australia. And part of bureaucracy is kind of, it's almost like the, the end of, um, not to spoil it, but the end of 1984, right? <laughs> Where they sort of, he, he loves Big Brother. You've got to find that, that bit that sort of makes you go, oh, I understand why it has to be, this particular way and up until that point it's very frustrating isn't it like up until the point where you actually figure out the why yeah. things just seem like they're in the way just to annoy you or just to justify something or and i'm sure there are things like that but navigating that is is, is a mission as well 
Um, how how have the current events then? I suppose you know I'm talking about coronavirus here with um, the, these different perspectives. Australia's really come out on top. I mean, to be frank, we're pretty we're pretty good, right? And I know that I mentioned I've, Taiwan. I've got, <laughs> no, I've deliberately come out of my well. I mean. We've come out on our own top, you know. Like we've come, we've 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 done well as 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 a nation ourselves. We we I've tried deliberately to watch a few videos this week around people still criticizing the government's reaction to things. So I do have an argument against what we've done, and I do have you know some points of views around around that. But I suppose my question is how how have you have you got a viewpoint uh, from from your listenerships about how people have viewed what's happening here in Australia, considering the news has become quite, um, you know, country centric as well. People are, tend to be getting their news from their own countries at the moment. I think they tend to be pretty impressed with Australia. I've had quite a few people in lessons recently. I was giving, I've got a Brazilian student and she was talking about a virologist in Brazil who was doing a video and mentioned Australia compared to Brazil. And she was really shocked. She was like, I wasn't expecting them to, to, tout Australia is, you know, one of the best countries yeah. in the world. Uh, she was expecting them to just ignore us, you know, and so she was really impressed. Right. She's really proud to be here. She's like, thank God that um, I moved my family from Brazil to Australia, considering how things are going in Brazil, where they have a, you know, an authoritarian uh, leader at the moment who says that the coronavirus is nothing worse than a cold and hasn't made any real changes to their social set up and so they've got thousands of people dying now but um it is interesting to see the difference between australia and america because it's almost like their attitude towards freedom is a thorn in the side for them i think at the moment because you know you've got all these people protesting against them having to have lockdown and um Mm. i think australia whilst we are very very passionate about our liberties we also know when we have to kind of suck it up and do what's good for everyone well, else. We also like our parents and yeah. grandparents. There's that too. We we <laughs> acknowledge their existence and their potential frailty. <laughs> Why? Do, yeah. How do you guys feel about our performance in comparison? This with- is not. This is not your yeah, interview, yeah. Pete. This is not your interview. We're we the ones asking the questions, the questions here. here buddy. <laughs> All right, sorry. <laughs> if the, if people want to know that, they can go to thepatchthepodcast.com where they can choose their favorite podcast player of choice. They've, they've already you've already covered that topic. <laughs> <And huh? listen. laughs> no, no, you're you're allowed to ask a question, Pete. Go ahead. Well, how do you think? How do air. you think we've done compared to uh, to <laughs> places like New Zealand, um, Britain, America, Canada? You go, Jake. <laughs> Can I, I, I like I, I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with our country's obsession with Jacinda Ardern. Yeah, I, I, I'm so. I, I, you know, to to have this taste of sort of a, an American Canadian situation where people on Facebook or people on Twitter or whatever will be like, I can't wait to fly over there and and become a New Zealand citizen. Gosh, I wish I could become a New Zealand citizen. And you're just like, you can, mate. Like you can. <laughs> we don't need to. Off you we go. We don't need to. We you just know? go there. <laughs> but you don't really want to, do you? You don't really want to. It's just that she's a little bit left of, you know, centre and it's all very fun. And um, But she's, you know, but she's I think never done blackface, so it's a little different from uh, Trudeau. Yeah, <laughs> well, that, yeah, that, they don't, that would be no. Conservatives here don't really have that, that over her. Yeah. It, it, um, it is an interesting one and particularly... Uh, you know, New Zealand, because they are so similar to us in many ways. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, broadly speaking, their response was pretty similar to ours as well. I mean, obviously, we've got... No, they had, they had that full-on lockdown, like, because like, I've got family over there, so I've been texting them because they've been... <laughs> Full blow and like you are. Under, don't you even think yeah. about going outside? outside. We you draw will those shoot blinds. You. Outside doesn't again. We'll exactly. use all the guns so that, that we've recently <laughs> confiscated. <Yep. laughs> so, oh, ouch. Yeah, I, I mean, I know what you mean. Like it has been similar, um, but they did go. They did go full full lockdown, and I think they've gone at least a day or several days without new cases at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. But so is South Australia. I think it is just it is just really interesting, though. It's a, such a stark difference between the US and Australia, even at a state level, where we're looking at the, what have we got, places like Virginia and that wanting to open up to business like it's normal again and, without and the curve. And Michigan and flattened. Texas, yeah. They're, and they're all people who have said, you know, I just, uh, I've just received a call from uh, one uh, Senor Trump or um, his <laughs> son-in-law and they've asked us to open the doors. And we said, yes, sir. Mr. Trump, sir, we will do. It's 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 so interesting, and I realise this is not an American podcast, and and uh, I need to temper my thoughts rather quickly. But it, it was so interesting to see the overwhelming response from America shut down, and now they're itching. Now they're freaking out 
of we must open it up and and you know you had instances of of Trump essentially inciting these uh these I, I, look, I'm going to refer to them as violent protests because you yeah. know may may not be violent in in action, um, but it is certainly violent in intent. If you walk out with a gun and uh, you know storm into your Capitol building, it's pretty intense. Um, but it, you know, in terms of the original question, I think Australia has done a remarkable job. I think you know we will be paying for this for generations, and I mean that quite literally. Um, you know, there there will be probably two or or but potentially three generations of uh, of children who will be born and, and interact with uh, our Australian economy who will be paying uh, off the debt that we've accumulated over this time um, through their, their taxation um, and, uh, and income and, and interactions with various other parts of the economy. But broadly speaking, we've averted a disaster. You know, we, we have lost almost 100 people now, um, you know, and most of those came through either a cruise ship or a, a, a plane. Um, but you know, again, broadly speaking, we've overcome potentially the the biggest major disaster that we could have, uh, you know, possibly seen immediately following one of the biggest potential disasters that we ever could have possibly seen, i.e. the bushfires, yeah. which was immediately preceded by one of the biggest disasters that we could could have ever possibly seen, i.e. the drought, the sustained drought yeah. across multiple states. So, I mean, Australia is and always has been a remarkable country of uh, you know polarised thoughts and opinions that have been galvanised under the leadership of, you know... I, I uh, I, I got to say, uh, you know, Morrison has done a tremendous job. I think, by and large, you know, there have definitely been things I should have acted probably twelve months sooner in terms of stimulus um, and listened to the Reserve Bank of Australia. <laughs> and but you know, that's that's certainly not suggesting that we could have come out any better or different um, had that stimulus. I mean, certainly we wouldn't ha- have had the amount of money to draw down on had we uh, provided stimulus beforehand. I, so I would love uh, to be a fly on the wall for ScoMo's, you know, dinner table. I bet he's just like, oh, thank God coronavirus happened after the bushfires. Whew. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think so. I, I know what you mean. I don't mean, I, I don't like to think that. I don't like to think that he thinks that way. I, I really don't. But anyway, that's, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting topic. And, and, and um, I, I don't know. I think that I, I, I always, I always, like to believe that the, the the politicians we've got have have good intentions and that they're not you know that yes they're politicians but that um that there is a bit of love in there and and that I've always I've always admired that about a lot of our politicians that are willing to actually speak love and all that sort of stuff so it's quite good. The other but, side of that is of course uh, Winston Churchill's quote: "Never waste a good crisis." <laughs> Someone's you got to. Someone's got to see you through the crisis, right? Someone's got to see you through it. What what um what what about um what about the America the English speaking countries, Pete? With your with your podcast, the Aussie English podcast. What is the what are the what do you have a lot of English speaking people who are getting something out of this too? I I've got a little bit addicted to it. I've got to say, I'm like, oh, he's got another <laughs> little video up. I'm gonna watch that. <laughs> you would be amazed. So I recently had someone buy an annual membership, my most expensive product, and their name was something like Bruce Turner. And I was I sent him <laughs> yeah. an email and was just like, you know, thank you so much for supporting the podcast and and you know me putting food on my table for my family and everything. And he, I was like, are you from America? Because at the bottom it said, you know, like Michigan or something on his on his email. And um, he's like, yeah, 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 we just love coming to Australia once a year to go to Port Douglas. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the equivalent of a Western Sydney person going to Aspen, you know. So, yeah, that's that's clearly a, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty awesome, man. <laughs> that's pretty random. And I have people that are actors. A lot of actors are buying wow. things like my pronunciation course because they're trying to do Australian pronunciation. Any that we know? So, or you're not allowed uh, to talk about it? Nah, no, no big names, but there are loads and loads of actors over there who are obviously having to apply for small parts that involve being yeah. an Aussie or something. I've had some people too who most recently I got an email this week from a guy who was Australian born here, moved to America, I think, in his teens and then has just moved back at the age of 40 and he's like, my Mm. accent's a mess. You know, Mm. I I need to straighten it out and make it back to, you know, make it great again, but Australia style. And so he's like, what do you recommend? And I was like, 
speech pathologist. <laughs> like, uh, like, man, not qualified. But that, if anything, pronunciation um, course, go for it. You know? <laughs> you'll have to you'll have to get your son into into speech pathology so that you can have the business. You'll have the whole business sorted out oh, there. Man, just corner the market. <laughs> al- yeah. Allied Allied Health. Not it's not a great paying job. But it, it, is, it is interesting to see the different um, demographics of people, you know. I was expecting there to be a load, a load of um, young people listening to the podcast, but it tends Pete to be... Pete can't actually speak English very well, apparently. Still working okay. on it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Just aim to improve every We're day. We're all students, aren't we, Pete? That's it. On the path of life. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there tends to be a lot of, you know, highly educated 25 to 45 year olds who are you know coming over from places like iran china brazil you know that it's that those tend to be some of the big ones that i never would have picked before doing the podcast so it is interesting and back to iran it's really interesting because i think the only people who can come here from iran have to be uh skilled workers and so every single one that i meet is an engineer an architect or you know something else that's just crazy they have a phd or something it's just nuts a hundred years ago, um, when I, I used to run call centers, um, and I'm, I'm probably talking about don't um, admit to that, Jake. Fifteen odd years, <laughs> I used to run telemarketing call centers, and and at the at evenings, we'd run we'd run uh, residential type campaigns. It was selling phone services, and right. um, thanks for interrupting so many of my dinners. <laughs> exactly, um, all of them awful because you would have been a student at that time. They just oh. Gross, Maggi noodles, but um, <laughs> but um, it was it was always so interesting. You'd hire these people for fifteen dollar an hour jobs, and they were you know quite often from the Middle East. They were nuclear. Yeah. I I hired a bunch of nuclear engineers. Um, you know, <laughs> like uh, I, I remember a quantum physicist. You know, like they have these incredible uh, educations, and they've come to Australia to work in a call center job. While they either, uh, you know, normalise their qualifications so they get a bridging type of thing so that they can uh, work in Australia in their actual qualified field or yeah. just so that they can work in Australia in a place that's not an oppressive regime. It's, it's crazy and this is one of those sort of ethical situations. I would love to ask you guys what you think, but when you have a country like Australia or America or Britain... We've already been on your podcast, Pete. <laughs> yeah, this you, is, you should have gotten your questions out of the way. What do you think, yeah. though, of IQ mining, where countries like America, Britain, Australia, these big economies are effectively taking the brightest minds from developing countries around the world for good, right? Because it seems to be a very difficult position to be in where you want to give anyone who's able to get here and will be good for our economy and our country, you know, the ability to come here and stay here. But we don't often think that any nuclear physicist you're taking from somewhere like Ethiopia, Iran, Brazil is one less that they have there back in their own home country to help solve the problems they potentially have. How do you square that? Well, surely they're coming here for opportunity that they, you know, perhaps didn't have uh, back there. But I suppose the, 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 uh, the thing is, Australia is a knowledge economy and, you know, yeah. in, invariably you, you have to be a bit of a moral utilitarian in that we have vacuums, you know, so to speak. We have vacuums in, in uh, our country well, where we require... Well, medicine's a good example, right? Yeah, yeah. In the rural areas you'll yes, find, yeah. you know, Indian and Iranian doctors living in yeah. the, the middle of the outback as, as uh, full-time doctors and you'd be like what how did you get here yeah. <laughs> by plane um yeah no the, yeah. <laughs> and, and, I walked. And, and they get absorbed into the community and yeah. and you know they become cornerstones you know often one of the most important individuals in a community is is the doctor they, they're the people yeah. that ensure that the productivity of that of that rural community is able to continue um, and particularly as our uh, rural populations age, because they they yeah. are they are transitioning to vastly older populations than they were uh, even just uh, a generation ago. Because everyone's bailing. Um, yeah, well, that's it's absolutely. I mean, there are more opportunities on on, on the coast uh, in our major cities, but uh, invariably, mm. without the fruit basket, without the bread bowl, without the uh, the meat, I don't know what what uh, goes with meat meat. Well, I wonder how there's. Sizzle? I wonder if there's going to be some kind of a tsunami because of 
coronavirus causing people to work from home now where we're just going to have a load of these jobs from now on just at home and things will become more decentralized you know you wonder if there's going to be a flood back into rural towns in the future where people say screw living in a city of four million people like i'm going Mm. i'm like greg just went to the blue mountains right you were like i need a, a bush change Tree we haven't actually yeah. announced that I mean, on the podcast. Like, yeah, there was a little bit in between that <laughs> that thought <laughs> and the actual process, but yeah, I mean, essentially, yeah, you can, you can. Well, I mean, but we have transferable skills as well. Like we're yeah. both teachers. Uh, my wife and I are both teachers, so we, you know, it's a transferable skill, I suppose. Um, you know, the 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 rural areas in Australia, I can see, have less of an enticement over time, right? Because I mean, farming is not as enticing as it once was. Um, you know, mining is um, not as enticing as, I don't know if it's ever been enticing, but mining is not as enticing as maybe it once was. You know, I think that, um, you know, that idea of fly and fly out and that the, 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 the person doing that fly and fly out isn't going to see their family as much anymore. Um, you know, what it does offer is community. What it does offer is, is are those higher spirits, you know, over time, I guess, a, a, you know, a quieter um, commute to work, mm. a quieter life overall. Um, you know, so those are the things you would have to want to work in those areas. And maybe that we're, we're going to see that big uh, sort of rush out or, like you say, you have the opportunity to go to a, a place, um, a rural area and do your job because of technology and the way that it's that it's been um, facilitated now as well. I mean, my, yeah. my big hope is that out of this we develop some or we reinvigorate some people's passion for manufacturing. Yeah. Um, and I mean, by, by passion, I mean sector-wide passion, you know, a desire to, um, you know, properly fund a manufacturing sector, uh, sector which in Australia means it's going to be expensive. So Australians have to be willing to, to pay for it. You know, we have to import some of the bits and pieces or we manufacture those bits and pieces as well, components that go into whatever we end up manufacturing. Mm. Um, but aside mm. from that, we have higher wages than, say, uh, our next nearest manufacturing place, which is, you know, either Indonesia or China or, or, or uh, you know, somewhere in, uh, you know, one of the Asian belts. But uh, I, I sincerely hope that out of this we recognise, um, you know, at the very beginning of the coronavirus, uh, uh, shopping centres were essentially saying nationwide we have roughly 30 days of general stock. Mm. At any time, we have we have roughly thirty days worth of stock. Well, that doesn't work if you deplete all stock, unfortunately. So what? And when you think about things like cans of soup, you know, we make all of the food in uh, our country, uh, and we make all of the um, uh, the cans. We put together the cans in our country. What we don't do is we don't mine tin so much anymore we don't have the electrolysis methods that are required to form the tins into the tin shape um so as a consequence while we make the food and while we package the stuff we don't have the expertise or the manufacturing capacity to you know uh, essentially do the whole process so if we if we as a as a country can come together and think about some of these sectors that have been um, exported overseas that we perhaps um, would like to reinvigorate here you know be smart about it solar cells you know mm. solar cells would be a great one we we had uh, expertise not so long ago in Australia um, with the, the the process of making the most efficient cells um, and they now you know our our intellectual property that was formulated here in Australia has been shipped over to China to 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 make there because essentially they can manufacture them cheaper and then import them back to Australia where we put them on our roofs. Well, we're addicted to that though, right? As a absolutely, as a we love today. we love to pay less, and yes. I get that. I get that. And it's so much easier to just buy something, use it for two years, throw it away, buy it again, and yep. you know, obviously the well, our capitalism favors is that. Rather reliant on it. Exactly. Mm. So I don't know mm. how you ever shift away from that now, unless you do use the government in order to make legislation to. Control I mean, America's that been sort of able behavior. to do that by just making junk. Like the stuff that's made in America is pretty bad. So you know you can have that consumerist. Uh, I'm making a a joke, but I realise I'm too sardonic. But the um, 
You know, there's all there's all those jokes about the the crappy American. Later, sardonic. There's all those jokes about the crappy American-made cars that fall apart yeah. in two years in order to fuel, if well, you like. We've seen them here in yeah. Australia, right? They've taken off Mustangs, the Yank yep. tanks. They're everywhere now. You know, the Commodores and the uh, Falcons are all gone. The way of the dodo. Mm. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I think that uh, it's part of it is driven by what people want, right? Like, I mean, we could get many more views on our podcast if we completely changed it and gave people what they want, right? I mean, look yes. at something like TikTok or something like that. I mean, what people want is not what, – what a general population want is not necessarily to, you know, guys having a chat about – politics every week right like we have to we have to deal with the fact that that's what we want to do Mm. and that's you know but if we were in the business of like if we were nova fm or something like that and they wanted us to do the podcast they're going to say look you're going to have to change pretty well everything about your show sell out because because it's not what people want and so there's a certain sort of well you know people don't you know well i guess the question is are people smart enough to know what they want are Mm. You know, are people? Do we take it for granted that people are smart enough? And are we the are we the silly ones for wanting better quality products? Where, you know, maybe people are just like, well, you know, it's it's, it's a, it gives us a good relationship with countries overseas. Overseas people get jobs; they they get to dig themselves out of poverty. You know, we get a relationship with them. We become a little bit reliant on them, sure. But you know, that's that's part of globalization, and I'd rather live in that um, society. And then I get things cheaper. Like, what's so bad about it? You know. Well, I guess we're seeing that now, right? With a lot of our economies being so heavily tied with China's economy and, you know, hmm. China tomorrow. They... But it will go back that way. It's not like it's going to stop. Yeah, but if China tomorrow decides they don't want any of our exports anymore, then we're in recession, right? I think it's something like 60 to yeah. 70% of our exports go to China. And so... Yes, it's... and most of them come from the ground. We're not se- yeah. we're not selling them cool stuff that we made in our factories. they make that themselves. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I know, less. I know... <laughs> I know we're sort of getting towards that hour mark, Pete. But what I'd love is is that um, is a little bit of a a little bit of a I suppose a, a brief history of that. Maybe just uh, with the climax being that moment that you knew that your podcast was going to be self sufficient for you. That you were gonna you didn't have to worry about your your, your PhD or oh, you know anything like that. That you actually are able to put money on the table. Uh, you and know, eat it. money on the table. Yeah. <laughs> and eat it. That's how rich <laughs> Pete Smithson is. That's how Thank strong you my that. digestive system is. <laughs> <laughs> Coins and all. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I guess you've got the point. What you know what, what, that that little journey about in that moment. You go, oh, hang on, I could probably make some money from this while still being a real positive influence on people's lives. Yeah, good question. Presuming you are, I am. I am. You know, <laughs> take it for what it is. But I, I remember having a conversation with one of my students who was like, "Have you monetized yet?" And I was like, "What's that?" You know, in terms of my podcast, because at the time, <laughs> what is money? Yeah, well, I was just releasing episodes, <laughs> trying to help people. It wasn't really a, you know, I want to, you know, get rich, bro down. Um, so I realized after having a chat with him that I could create content that sort of went with the podcast, that was, you know, a bonus material or whatever, um, and and sell that, sell memberships to that. And I remember f- suffering somewhat, especially during my PhD, from imposter syndrome, which is a huge thing in, in the scientific world, especially if you're doing academia, where you just don't think you're good enough. You don't think you know enough, you know, because there's so much ego posturing of other people who also suffer from imposter syndrome. But I felt that with, I'm not a qualified English teacher, you know, I'm, I'm not a qualified podcaster, whatever that is. I've just started this in my bedroom and, and started doing it, which... Oh, well, you know, that makes you a qualified podcaster. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> the first two episodes we did, I was literally... The first two episodes that Jake and I did of The Pouch, I was literally underneath a, a blanket because we decided to go on holidays. <laughs> <laughs> and you needed some My family sound. and I went on holidays. And, I'd, and I was Googling on the way down how to record a podcast yeah. or your way. They're like, ah, it's fine. Just use your phone and go under a blanket. And I'm like, this I've is done great. that. I've done that too. I've done that too. And In fact, I had a box and I just stapled a blanket inside of it with the microphone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> In fact, well, that's it, isn't it? I mean, now you've just got like a bigger box, right? That's that's it. You've just got a fancier yeah. box. I know uh, there were ep- at the end of some episodes... <laughs> Because we leave like a little, um, you know, snippet of of, a, of an outtake or something. <laughs> some there were some episodes at the end um, when we first started. <laughs> it was just basically me going, taking the blanket off my head and just go. Oh, I can breathe. Oh, <laughs> I was human under here. So I was like shirtless and just sweat dripping down everywhere and all this sort of stuff. And we're talking 
anything about the bushfires at the time. Anyway, but yeah, so, okay, so you, you sort of, you, you started off and then you started to branch out. So you're talking about things like um, like subscription models and stuff like yeah, that? Is that like you well, had another... it, it was definitely costing me money because I had to host things, I had to transcribe things to give people the written, you know, transcripts of the podcasts. And so it was starting to add up and I thought, you know, well, I've got to try and offset this at the very least. Um, so I just asked the audience, you know, would you pay for transcripts? Is that a good idea? Would mm. you appreciate mm. that? Because then I can obviously pay more attention to making them better quality and, and do more for yeah. you. And they said yes. And I was, I remember opening it up and, you know, I think I made something like $70 worth of sales in the first month. <sighs> and I was chuffed because I was like, holy crap, people are buying from me. You know, something that I've, yeah. you know, made from scratch, people mm. are paying money for. And then it just kept increasing month after month. And, uh, an important aspect of it was just maintaining that connection with the audience and asking, what do you want? What are you having trouble with? You know, it was sometimes I would notice that I hadn't kept in touch for months at a time. And I was just going off on a, on a tangent that I thought was helpful. And then you'll, you'll Mm. ask them again, you'll do a survey or, you know, just ask people to get to email you and have a conversation with them. And you'd find out, you know, actually they're trying to get help with this thing. They want a course on this. They want content that does this. And the more and more I listened to them and started trying to create the content without trying to be perfect and without pretending to be someone I'm not, you know, this buy this one yeah. course and after three months, you're going to be, you know, as good as anyone who's born in Australia. After just being honest and, and asking people what they want and then creating the products that just sort of snowballed and has just kept growing ever since. So, yeah. And then um, I guess I finished my PhD when I was working in a restaurant and I was doing that largely to pay for the rent because my scholarship for the PhD had run out. Uh, And I realized that my income from the podcast was getting to a few thousand dollars a month. And I was like, holy crap, you know, this this is going to pay for rent and food. And it seems to be increasing, you know, a few hundred dollars a month every month. So maybe it'll eventually get to a wage. And I remember telling my my supervisor at at uni, because he was like, oh, what are you going to do after you finish your PhD? You need to apply for these jobs or these postdocs overseas mm. in America mm. and Europe. You know, you like, need- no, I don't, man. No, I said I to him, man, I'm going yeah. to be a scientist. Yeah, I'll do what I want, man. Off on a motorcycle. Well, it's just like, I don't, I don't know <laughs> if I really want to be a scientist because uh, you guys are pretty cutthroat and it's pretty brutal and, did you not? So you, so you were, you were having those thoughts beforehand. So this wasn't, 100%. this just sort of gave you that. You gave you that permission to be able to ha- explore that thought a bit more rather than well, sort of go, well, I'm just stuck with this. Yeah, so in the last year of my PhD, I met my wife, Kel, on YouTube. She sent me a message just saying, great job. I'm from Brazil. I thought it was really helpful. And I you know, saw her on there and was like, I'm learning Portuguese. Which part of Brazil are you from? We struck up a conversation and then I asked her to marry, her, marry me and boom, she's, you know. Yeah, just, boom. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it. yeah, great. It's a YouTube. <laughs> it's a YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's a I'd, I'd, romance. I'd finished, I was finishing the PhD. I, I'd met her and I was like, I sort of want to give this a go. I don't really want to, you know, a, a nine to five job. And it was funny. I asked my dad, I'm like, what do you reckon? Should I give the podcast a go? And what do you think I should just try and get a real job? And he's like, if you, he said, what's a podcast? No, he pretty much said, if you, <laughs> if you haven't worked it out yet, you're not going to be doing nine to five. Pete. You're not that kind Is of it a making person. money. Yes. Okay. Well, that you're doing better than the PhD already. So off we well, go. And I told my supervisor, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to just give the podcast a go. Cause I reckon I'll be making more than you in about a year. And um, <laughs> And lo and behold, <laughs> speaking of speaking of being oh, smug, you, you, yeah, you hey? could have uh, you passed up the opportunity, Pete, to be on the job keeper right now. No, actually, I can. <laughs> you know, I'm applying for that currently. So thanks. Oh, there you okay. go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Look, I've, but that that was uh, effectively that, that, the, the nutshell. I had to just let go, give it a go, and um, you know, the the world didn't collapse. Uh, I'm not rich yet, but I can pay for things. Have, stay at home with my kid all day, every day, with my wife, and. You know, it's just just one income, but we're managing, and it's good fun. So, and what about the what about the impact of coronavirus on your on your listenership or on your podcast? Has it, I, I suppose this is a great test, right? Like this is if you can survive COVID nineteen in twenty twenty, you've, you've you're onto a good thing. Well, yeah, I was thinking at the at the start, I'm like, this won't touch me. You know, everyone's going to be studying at home now. But um, I think in the last month, it's definitely income revenue has decreased quite a bit. So I think people are feeling the pinch now. A lot more and I've had quite a few, you know, cancellations just saying like I'm I'm really sorry, I want to keep going, but I can't because I just don't have enough money. And I think it's it's sad that the the students that are sort of marooned stuck in Australia at the moment, especially the overseas ones who are working so hard and are a big backbone of the country, are in such a difficult position. I think thankfully, I don't know if it's if it's countrywide, but in Victoria they can get money now, some of the students to be able to um pay for rent and everything. Um 
but yeah, I think we're going to, I think we're going to do all right. I think we'll, we'll pull through, but we have been affected just like, you know, all the other industries, but it does help because life hasn't changed much. I am just living the same life that I was pre coronavirus yeah. inside every day, creating content, going out for one coffee and a walk. <laughs> and so, you know, not, not seeing anyone. So, well, Pete, do you want to, uh, do you want to give the listeners a bit of a, 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 a breakdown of how they can find you and if they, you know, were so inclined after hearing you uh, talk for, for a little while today? That's a bit presumptuous, Jake. <laughs> yeah, I, no, well, I, I'm, incl- I'm inclined. I'm ready. I've got nah, my pen. If you, if, if, I'm good to if go. If any of you guys are interested in Australian history and culture and interviews and you're native speakers of English, you can find Aussie English. Just search it on, on Google or, you know, type in aussieenglish.com.au. If you know anyone who is learning English, Australian English, or if you are yourself, definitely go and check it out. And um, yeah, tune into the podcast, the Aussie English podcast, if you want to learn more about Australian English history, culture, news and current affairs. Number one podcast for that. Oh, you've you got that down pat. And I've said that quite a few times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pete, um, We're still in the advertising phase, so I'm still like the pat. So podcast.com. Well, that's what you guys need to work out a way. I don't need ads because I can promote my own stuff on the podcast. So that's the best part. I just start the episode and it's like, blah, 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 blah. Make sure that you check out my products. Blah. Let's get going. You know. <laughs> Well, we we just invented news and politics, not so seriously. That's it. That's our that we just we just sort of. TM. But we do we do have up. the um the Scott Morrison poster, um yes. the uh, Scott Morrison earrings, <laughs> and the Jacinda Ardern tea towels. Yes. Ah, uh, where can we get those? From at the pouch of the podcast. The pouch <laughs> the podcast. <laughs> yes. Now, um, yeah, okay, all right. So check out the Aussie. Now, I want to be very specific about this. It's A-U-S-S-I-E, just in case people end up going to like some weird Aussie Osborne um, podcast exactly. or something. like It is, it is, <laughs> A-U-S-S-I-E. That's a very different podcast. Exactly, exactly. But you'll find it. Just type in Australian English podcast, you'll find it. And Pete, final question. I, that's how I found it. Yeah. Final question. Am how I wearing say- pants? How do you say? How do you say? <laughs> how long have you not been wearing pants? <laughs> how do you say isthmus? Isthmus. I would say yeah. isthmus. Yeah. Isthmus. I s t h m u s. Yeah. Isthmus. I don't think I would say isthmus. No. Yeah. Too much. What Too is much. that? An isthmus. Oh, you go, Pete. I don't even know. Isn't that like related <laughs> to an island? Yeah. Uh, it's an. Like it's part an that juts it's out a like small a island. Ex- yeah. Exactly. Are you talking about? Christmas? <laughs> no, not, it. no, it's a like uh, Christmas island. No, no. The, so an isthmus is a small island that is connected to a main uh, main body. So uh, Fraser Island. Christmas Island. Yes, Fraser Island is a good example. Whereas Christmas Island is off the coast, and uh, oh, is I thought you were just mispronouncing Christmas Island. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, isthmus. So isthmus. Uh, so Pete, uh, are you Ridgy Didge or just a cobber looking to rip off your mates for a quick buck? There you go. I'm both. I'm both. I'm Ridgy Didge. <laughs> Fair income, Ridgy Didge. I wanted to – have you done all of those? Have you done Ridgy Didge? I don't know if I have. I don't think I have. It's, it's so hard. Is it actually a thing? It's, I just – I might have this, made it up. This is the difficult thing with going down that. There are definitely a lot of Australian expressions that people know, but I don't know if they use, right? So things like Ridgy Didge, it's kind of like every single person knows what that is, but I don't think I ever hear people using it naturally That's they'll use point. it ironically and be like yeah yeah this guy's ridgy didge yeah you know or the oh it's man it's dry as a dead dingo's donger out here and you're like no one says yeah. that naturally they say it because they're trying to make a joke right it'd be stupid oh. i mean fair shake of the sauce bottle buddy <laughs> <laughs> just just yeah. just I put your shoulder dinkum. to the grind to the no put your I shoulder think- to the cart wasn't it Recent, that was a recent one. Yeah, the shoulder to the cart. Yeah. yeah, we had to have basically a whole episode explaining that one. What? Uh, the, yeah, I, uh, I can see what you mean. That's really interesting. Like mm. I would have thought, yep, that's your, that's your content. But what's what's the point in that? Well, you have to um, realize they're the just going to look silly if they get off the plane yeah. and they're like, "Isn't this Ridgy Didge?" You know. Like, well, I remember everyone's going to be someone, like, "No, you're trying too hard, mate." Someone <laughs> sent me an email, and every second word was slang. And I was just like, yeah, right. right, you're going to have to lay off. You're going to have to lay it like, hey, how's it going, Cobber? I just wanted to have a yarn so that I could just, <laughs> I was like, just, you, you can sort of, it's like one of them a paragraph, 
One one slang word a paragraph's enough, you know. <laughs> and that's interesting that you have to quantify that, right? Yeah. That that that's the interesting thing to me is that you go, okay, what is the actual formula for using these things that we? Do? My one of my favorite ones is Arj Barker. Um, you'd know it for sure when he um when he talks about the fact that you know we have these crazy slang words and that he reckons that he could just make it up. He knew the formula and he could just make it up. Uh, so he went around the shopping center <laughs> and the lady said, you know, um, do you need a hand? And he goes, no, nah, thanks, mate. Just having a squid. Did you? And, um, <laughs> and she was like, oh, spot on. You know? And she was like, yeah, okay, no worries. And you're like, that's so funny. I knew exactly what he meant. And yeah, so I don't know. I, do, I, I, I think we've wrapped up the podcast, but I'm still going. ADHD's kicked in. Um, what uh, <laughs> Ritland's worn off and off we go. What, um, what, uh, uh, the, uh, what about these? Like, like I know, what are these ones that you have in, um, in Ireland? What are they called? Like, um, uh, you, you know, the rubbery dub and all that sort of oh, stuff. Cockney. Like, is that Cockney's rhyming? Cockney. Yeah, Cockney. Cockney. North, Do they Northern. actually use that? Yeah. Is that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, or are other countries in the similar boat the to weird us? thing, I was watching something recently on YouTube that was about Cockney rhyming slang, and they still use it over there quite a lot. I think in Australia, it's died off. My dad jokes about it sometimes, you know, like a dog's eye and the dead horse and everything. And I think, again, yeah. I'll use it, but I'm taking the piss, right? I'm yeah, not right. really serious about it but we do use we do actually use quite a bit like um taking the mickey is one of them yeah. there's quite a few of them that are sort of subtle that you don't even realize are actually rhyming slang originally but you know are still being used but those dead horse dog's eye and all of that sort of stuff it's kind of you know yeah it's definitely well, past it- even just in the last few conversations that we've had, because we were on your podcast, you're on our podcast, I've been I'm so much more consciously aware of when we've used certain, like I suppose, Australianisms or slang or you know whatever it is. It's 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 interesting to sort of go, oh, that'd be a good one to do, and and how unnatural it is. Have more conversations. To use a word like, have more conversations with Americans and Canadians, and just wait for them to yeah. give you the. That, that sort of twisting their head like you've shown a dog a car <laughs> trick kind of a thing. I'm like, what? Because I'll say yeah. things like, oh, man, I don't, you know, I barrack for the Essendon. What are you talking about? And they'd be like, barrack? What the hell is barrack? Right. What's like, yeah. Some, yeah, I don't root them, man. I don't root them. You know, I don't have sex with them. And they'll be like, what do you mean have sex? And I'll be like, oh, my God, you're not even speaking uh, my easy. language. Get a Vegemite sandwich up, yeah. Awesome. Pete Smithson, thanks so much for joining us today. Check out the Aussie English podcast and uh, we hope you get a few subscribers along your way. And thanks so much for making our world a better place. Man, it's been Ridgy Didge. Good on you, mate. It has. <laughs> so Cheers. great talking Ta. to you, buddy. <laughs> you know what else isn't podcast worthy? I have to wee. <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just, if only you I had like a, an infrared or no, you, a Bluetooth mic and ding, you can ding. just keep going. Just...